Monster Professor. Welcome to The Monster Professor, a show in which we discuss and explore monsters in literature, myth, film, games, folklore, culture, and beyond. We're going to dig deep, so be prepared. I'm your host, Josh Woods, author, editor, and monster expert. And today, we're going to talk about witches. What do you do with witches? I don't know if you can hear that in the background, but that's a real storm pouring down on me. It just started... About the time I said, okay, I'm going to talk about witches, I pull open the Malleus Maleficarum, the Bible, some other occult books, get everything around me, and then here comes the storm. Maybe that's just a coincidence. Actually, I don't know, though, because when I when I released my book, The Black Palace, essentially about witches, weird stuff started happening around the house. Snakes started making their way not only in the garage, but in the house, like big ones, man and spiders started multiplying it's been getting weird around here okay so witches oh man where do we begin let's start with the concept of witches i can't find any culture that we have any record of that did not have witches or to say that in reverse or the obverse and the positive every culture that we know of has had witches And I don't mean like, well, kind of witches, if you just reinterpret what they meant by witch. No, I mean like exactly what we think of witch to be today. Every culture has always had something like that throughout time and throughout the world. If anyone can find a culture that didn't have witches, let me know. I have yet to been able to find one. Um, And so what we mean by witch, this this person, often female, but not always, who has supernatural powers, that they're mostly human but not entirely, that they they confront or cavort with supernatural beings and therefore a little bit above and beyond that, that they always pose a danger, although they could in fact use their powers for good, although that seems to be in the minority. Um, this concept of which, quite general and, and I think quite widely accepted as the concept of which, that's always what witch has meant. It hasn't been like other words, like wizard, for instance. An old guy with a long gray beard and the staff and he casts spells and gives you good advice. Uh, the word wizard before that was some version of the form wisdom. So, but witches, however, have just always meant witches. And the original word in English was Wicca or Wicca for male or female witch. There are some wild guesses as to what that word comes from, but none of that has any grounding past the idea that witches have always meant witches, and they always have witches or witches. There's something to that. I don't know. I think if we were going to dig into, like, say, the collective unconscious, Carl Jung would probably, well, kind of did say that the anima is deep in our heads, are inherited in our brains, and we're not entirely aware of it, but it rises up through images like the witch and has shape-shifting powers and chaotic urges to life like the witch. And sometimes the witch in the story is indeed that anima coming up. I don't know, but I know we have them and we have tales of them. So which witches do I want to talk about? How about... How about let's start, we're not going to go chronologically, by the way, like we did in our uh, Monsters and Literature podcast, and we're not going to stick to just literature, we're going to bounce around everywhere. So let's go, how about the Witch of Endor from the Old Testament in First in First Samuel um, in the Old Testament? We meet a really cool, or we have a really cool moment with a witch. We got an old king, Saul who is on his way out in that he's displeasing the Lord. We got an up-and-comer who's doing everything right up to this point, a young guy named David. And and Saul is under siege by the Philistines. His prophet, Samuel, is dead. Things are closing in on him and going poorly. And he's reacting poorly, and he doesn't know what to do. So he really needs advice from his dead prophet, and the only way he knows how to do it anymore, after trying everything, after even 
consulting the signs himself. He's like, I gotta go, I guess, find a witch who can talk to the dead and hope that she can talk to him. Of course, oops, I have banned all witches in the lands. And so he has to sneak away from the lands that he has control over off to a land called Indoor. And he disguises himself so no one knows it's him. Because otherwise, there's no way a witch would talk to a witch killer and a witch banner. And so he disguises himself and he goes to the witch of Endor. And he's like, you gotta call up the dead for me. Uh, let me let me tell you what I need. And so she starts to do her work. And up from the ground rises this spirit. And she sees him and she recognizes Oh no, this is the prophet Samuel, the prophet to the king, Saul, which is probably this guy right here in front of me in disguise, and he's a witch killer. I'm in deep trouble. And she starts freaking the hell out. Um, and I think there might be some indication in there or some hints at there that as soon as this thing starts rising out of the ground, the witch of Vendor is a little bit freaked out that it's even actually happening and working, especially now that she knows she's summoning the spirit of the dead prophet of the Lord and his king is right in front of her and she's in deep trouble. And uh, Saul uh, and the Samuel doesn't care about getting summoned by a witch or what witches are. He just starts chewing out the king Saul, and Saul doesn't care. Like, uh, you know, I'm not. Don't worry. I, I I made you do it. I'm. I know what I'm doing here, and I'm not going to kill you for doing this. And so she gets off the hook. Um, but I think that's a that's a really cool moment, that moment of her surprise that this thing that she's making come out of the earth actually does work and it happens to be somebody she did not expect. It's freaky and it's cool. Ah, oh, man, where do we go? Like ancient Rome, they had witch. Of course, everybody had witches. Uh, but ancient Rome wouldn't really witch hunt in the way that we might expect, say, ancient people to witch hunt they were really pragmatic people and what they would do is put you on trial but only for actual damages for instance if your cattle died and it's because you think some witch cast a spell and made them die you could take her to court but not for being a witch because whose business is it, is it of you or the state that she's a witch you take her on trial because she owes you reparations for the cattle that she killed and so you could sue her for the price and they would work that out and make her have to pay you back so they that worked well i i think for them i think most people consider the danger for which is the bad time to be a witch uh was a time starting about 1375 in switzerland that a lot of people now call well not a lot of people i guess in the wiccans culture i think they refer to it as the burning times from about late 1300s uh to late 1700s was the real witch hunting phenomenon or the, the witch hunting scare in which the numbers vary on how many people were executed as being witches but uh i think I think the actual the the estimates that we get just from going through the records so the minimum number that we know of for sure seems to be at 50,000 and the the unrecorded and the guessed at number ten, tends to round out at about 9 million people uh, over the course of the late 1300s to late 1700s maybe even nine million people executed for being witches and it wasn't just old women and it wasn't just old and young women it was men in some cases it was children as well every type of person and not just poor people like out on the edges of town who were kind of weird and had a lazy eye and walked funny or something like that it was all uh i mean you know, the under the underprivileged and people who didn't defend themselves well in court and didn't weren't well connected, probably more likely to lose the case and get executed. But people at the highest levels of royalty and society were uh, getting accused of being witches, losing those trials and being tortured and or executed. Um, what 
some people have said really kicked off the burning times, the major witch hunts. Uh, 1375, I think around Switzerland was some of the, they were some of the first people to start killing witches and they ended up being kind of the last people. So the Swiss held on to this anti-witch policy until I think the last most recent, uh, witch execution that we would consider of that era would be 1782 once again in Switzerland. But what kicked it off, I think, well, according to some scholars, was at the uh, the end of the 1300s was about the time that the most recent bubonic plague ended. And not only were a lot of people trying to figure out, like, oh, what has caused all this insane plague and death, but also all of society was kind of shaken up like that. And no one was safe and nothing was safe. And then that kind of paranoia can lead to, of course, witch hunting types of of uh, attitudes and cultures. But another change was a lot of the uh, justice systems in Europe went from what they call accusatorial procedure to inquisitorial procedure. Accusatorial would be that most crimes are handled as civil crimes like we would have in modern America, uh, civil court as opposed to criminal court. Somebody sues you for something or takes you to court over some grievance and it's worked out there. Like, like, um, like I said, they worked on in ancient Rome, but in Christian Rome, like after the pagan Rome turned Christian, it went much more inquisitorial. And then that faded away in the medieval times, but then uh, late 1300s, getting closer and closer to Renaissance and early modern, the system changed back to the Christian Roman procedure in which it wasn't just citizen versus citizen in the court. Now it was the state accused you of something. And now it was time for the state to walk in and drop inquisitors on you and find out whether or not the state decides that you are what the state says you are. And so in this world, uh, it's no longer kind of a fair battle. And the inquisitorial procedure mixed with those latent fears of the bubonic plague, mixed with a whole bunch of other concerns and worries. This is happens to coincide with um, the expansion, uh, colonial and imp, imp, uh, imperial expansion in Europe. I think that's no coincidence that a whole bunch of fears of outside forces start rising up in people's heads. And then we have these witch hunts. Nor can I say that they didn't actually have real witches to contend with. I almost forgot another one of my favorite witches, Tichuba. You've heard of the famous Salem witch trials. Uh, 1692, uh, yeah, 1692, that started up. And one of the reasons it was one of the most famous witch trials, even at the time, is because things went so out of hand in that they didn't follow... Uh, the letter of the law or that didn't go by the book as far as witch trials went. So not only is it kind of seen now when we look back at it as an example of like rumor and accusation and you know social fears getting out of hand, even at the time, it was like, what? This is not how a witch trial is supposed to go. It's supposed to go much more organized than this. They are not following proper witch hunting procedure. And Tituba was the very first one accused of witchcraft in what ended up being the famous Salem witch trials. In fact, she was, she was a slave and she was originally from somewhere in South America, probably. We don't know a whole lot about her, but she came from a hoodoo voodoo background. So it goes like this, essentially. She's sitting around telling all these great indigenous tales and these really old, like, magic tales. Tales that we would now look back at as being, like, the really cool folklore. And she would tell these little girls in Salem, you know, the non-slave girls, all these little white girls. She'd be telling them all these little, uh, all these amazing stories. 
and word got out to the adults that here's this creepy slave Tichuba telling all these witchcraft stories. They accuse her, put her up on the stand, and they were like, tell us what happened. Tell us what you did. You know, are you a witch? Do you have these powers? Did you cavort with the devil? And she's got this whole room of people just wrapped around her finger, all the attention that a storyteller could ever want. And so she's on the stand and she's like, did I? Oh, yes. Did I ever? Let me tell you. Let me tell you about these dancing cats in the trees. And and we went out and we did this and we did that. And she's telling all that she's just, you know, doing the doing this great storyteller stuff. And everybody's going wild with this. And they're like, was anyone else involved? She's oh, yeah, sure. You were involved. And you were, oh, look, I can see the spirits coming in right now through the courtroom. It's hanging over you right there. They're, oh, no. And everybody's getting wild. And she's such a storyteller that it possesses, I mean, it just, it's everything they need. All their fears come together in this great story. Just like a lot of great stories, people, uh, people can very quickly become possessed by them and actually, and go to extreme lengths of real action based on the stories that they get obsessed with. And she ended up causing this uh, cascading events that we now look back as this uh, this crazy event called the Salem Witch Trials. And she's one that just got away scot-free. They're like, okay, you know, you did your part. You can go now. <laughs> and she's fine. There was no punishment after that. And it's not clear what happened after after that. A um, friend of mine called her the greatest American storyteller we have. And I think if you're looking at telling a story so compelling that people can no longer distinguish reality and fantasy and it takes over a whole community, well then, yeah, you are one hell of a storyteller. And so was she also a witch? Yeah, sure, I guess so. I don't know. I mean, probably in that kind of hedge witch, wise woman way of do this to ward off fever, do this to get rid of warts, that kind of thing. Um, but more than anything, she was a witch who was a great storyteller. So that's Tichuba. Another witch I want to talk about, famously involved in all this, is Matthew Hopkins. He's My cat just jumped up here. I think she heard me talking about witches. I don't know if you can hear her purring now. Um, Matthew Hopkins is famously known as the Witch Finder General. And this was around, like, you know, mid early to mid 1600s and this was in Cromwell's England and he took it upon himself uh, to end up being the one who goes out and finds the witches and puts them you know puts them to trial and puts them to death and he did in how many he um, he ended up killing uh, 300 women in just like two years of witch finding and, and executions. And the dude was only 20, uh, 24, 25 when he was doing all this. And he appointed himself witch finder general and started uh, seeking out witches, putting them on trial, executing them, torturing them in horrible ways. There's a Vincent Price movie. Um, made of it it's kind of it's kind of a disturbing movie and um, kind of ends in a way that like the original mad max kind of ends where you see like the good guys having to go so far to stop the bad guys that they very quickly become the bad guy themselves anyway so oh uh, yeah this witch finder general things end up turning on him in the last days of his life and he's put on trial as being one of the very witches he's been hunting and indeed gets executed in a horrible well they throw him in the river and he floats so that's proof that he's a witch so he's very quickly executed that's matthew hopkins a witch finder general and little did everyone know ends up being a witch himself I think it's worth noting, by the way, that we talk about these witch trials um, as things of the past, you know, like the, what, you know, late 1700s is the end of these witch hunting things, but it's still going on today. Uh, like in Africa, people are being hunted and tortured and murdered for accusations of witchcraft and so although say in america and europe we've stopped hunting and killing witches 
or killing innocent people in the name of witchcraft. It's still going on. Like when we talk about monsters, we are not just talking about these imaginary things and literature and stories and history long gone. If we don't really know what it is that we're dealing with when we're telling monster tales, what's to keep it from rising up and becoming living things right in front of us? Um, at least perhaps one more type of public service announcement that makes talking about monsters worthwhile. So I mentioned, I think, did I mention the Malleus Maleficarum? I have it sitting out right here. This uh, Trent Latin for the Hammer of the Witches, it's a handbook on how to understand, how to detect, and how to fight witches. And this was of the era. It was written by a guy who called himself Henricus Institorius, and I think it was it was first published in Germany. Um, that would have been about the year 1487, I think it first came out. And it's still available now. You can get it on Amazon.com or wherever you buy your witch-finding books. It was it was used by inquisitors and witch hunters. Uh, they, we call them witch hunters now a little bit. The, before that, they were called uh, witch masters and witch finders. Uh, so I just flipped to a page at random, and I'll just give you a sense of what it's like. Here's a, a, a moment from the Malleus Maleficarum. A lot of it's broken down into questions or concerns, and then the answer or the argument. And it said, this one is, how in modern times witches perform the carnal act with incubus devils and how they are multiplied by this means. And the response to that is, but no difficulty arises out of what has been said with this regard to our principal subject, which is the carnal act which incubi in an assumed body perform with witches, unless perhaps anyone doubts whether modern witches practice this abominable coitus, and whether witches had their origin in this abomination. In answering these two doubts, we shall say, as to the former of them, something of the activities of witches who lived in olden times, about four 1400 years before the incarnation of our Lord, it is, for example, unknown whether they were addicted to these filthy practices as modern witches have been since that time. And, so, and, it, and it goes on and on to suspect that witches of the past were just uh, uh, possessed or overcome by the demonic powers that turned them into witches, but modern witches are worse because they want to do it and they seek these pleasures out. So even in even in this thing, um, you get even in the witch hunting burning times era a manual, you get this sense of uh, the world ain't what it used to be. Even the witches used to be better than these modern ones who are just up to nothing but trouble. It seems to be that those kinds of attitudes never quite go away. Uh, we haven't talked about a whole lot of particular witches, which of Endor. Um, let's mention, how about the Baba Yaga? Shall we talk about the Baba Yaga? Uh, she shows up. She is a witch that shows up in Russian folk tales, And a general image of her tends to be kind of this babushka, this uh, Slavic grandmother, you know, with a scarf tied around her her head and hunched over and under these thick coats but the Baba Yaga has iron teeth I think to help her eat children uh, which she tends to want to do or actually do in the Russian folk tales mm, fairy tales um, she has in some of the stories she has wooden knees and even wooden legs in some of them she right she flies around in a writing a pestle like the like what apothecaries would you you know the stone bowl and the and the um, uh, mortar that's it pestle and mortar she wouldn't write on the pestle she'd write in the mortar the the bowl and uh, I think use the pestle to like um, 
kind of oar her way across the night skies. And she lived in the chicken foot house, which all we really know about it is it's a house that stood on a chicken foot or on chicken feet. Um, the comic book artist Mike Mignola, who created Hellboy, uh, had introduced the Baba Yaga as a pretty regular character and top evil villain for Hellboy. And he had this wonderful image of this old Russian cottage on this giant single chicken leg standing above the trees. It's so cool. And there were there she also some tales have her like um having skulls as lanterns, skulls of dead sinners and their their damned souls in the skulls would be the light instead of candles. Uh, there's so many cool tales of her. Most of the tales involve her either as a kind of side character in which a hero is contending with somebody else, such as uh, Koski the Deathless, right? And the character would need something kind of supernatural like a horse faster than all other horses and so he would go off and find the Baba Yaga who kept such magical special demonic or undead horses and make a deal with her and she would you know uh, she would load the dice on these deals hoping that the hero couldn't succeed at some impossible task so she would get him as a slave or get him as a meal or just get his soul and he would oftentimes get the horse and win against all odds and do her wrong, but she would, you know, inadvertently help him. But the, probably the more common uh, story of the Baba Yaga, or the ones that she's involved in, are these little girls that find their way to her or sent there, like by an evil stepmother. And the Baba Yaga just wants to eat this kid. And so the uh, Baba Yaga, even though the little girl's a nice girl and she helps out like little woodland creatures and fence posts and stuff along the way, showing how nice she is up to get to Baba Yaga's house. Baba Yaga just wants to eat her. And so she wants her to take a bath, essentially to clean herself up while the Baba Yaga gets the cauldron boiling so she can boil her down. But all the little creatures that she helped, like the cat and woodland creatures, help her escape. And the Baba Yaga chases her away, um, chases her as the little girl flees. The little girl has like these magical implements, like she'll throw a comb behind her and suddenly the comb will burst up into a, a giant forest that the Baba Yaga now has to contend with. And so she she loses the little girl, but then she catches back up and the little girl will throw a mirror behind her and it will turn into a large lake that the Baba Yaga has to paddle across or run around. And, and so the little girl finally gets all the way home back to the evil stepmother. And a lot of these Russian tales end up with the mother going, Oh, well, I just made for you to die. So I'm just going to kill you right here and then feed you to the Baba Yaga. Uh, sad ending, the end. That's how Russian tales go. Time out for a tangent. Let's do another personal story tangent. When I was... When I was about, was it was in fourth grade, and there were kids in school who were convinced that this thing was working called Bloody Mary, and I didn't know what Bloody Mary was. Neither did anyone else at the time know that you know exactly uh, whom that was a reference to, but this Bloody Mary was a witch, and she could be summoned in the mirror if you turned out all the lights, and you looked in the mirror, and you said her name over and over again, an image of her would appear behind you, and depending on what you saw, it might be your doom or your death. And kids would, like, sneak out of class or ask to go to the restroom. They would arrange times to go to the restroom, turn off the lights, and they'd all gather around the mirror and do Bloody Mary. And then they would run screaming out of the bathroom down the halls, and teachers would be freaking out because kids were 
doing interesting things. I don't know. And it got to be a problem where like they changed the bathroom procedures and they had like extra hall monitors and the principal was getting on the intercom saying, no more bloody Mary. Like actually referring to it directly. Like we are tired of you doing this bloody Mary nonsense. No more. I was freaking terrified of the concept of getting in trouble or anything like that of the concept of this actually working and summoning this witch in your mirror and that summer moved uh moved states our family did and i ended up uh spending the summer in this creepy old house of my grandmother's full of mirrors full of really old antique mirrors every room i went into these got these high wooden old witch like beds and these uh, these almost secret rooms actually one of them still did up like a 19 uh, 10 1915 style uh, of a great grandmother that used to live there or great great grandmother to me to me that might as well have been a witch room and you sneak in there and it's full of mirrors i spent that whole summer just like running from room to room with my eyes covered just trying not to look in a mirror because i knew bloody mary was looking at me out of every reflective surface uh, so I think all these personal stories end up being either sad or terrifying. Like I just had nothing but a traumatic life as it comes to monsters and uh, these kinds of creatures. Anyway, let's call that tangent and done. Man, there's so much more to say about witches. Um, where, where do I even go now? Uh, what do you do with a witch if you have one? to deal with there's some old appalachian folk tales that say if you draw a picture of the woman that you know to be doing witch work against you if you draw a picture of her on a tree or if you get a picture of her and you put it on a tree and then you tap it and you draw a cross over where her heart would be in this picture and you tap a nail into that heart but don't drive it all the way in you just barely tap it in and then every and then she'll start to take ill and then every day you tap it just a little bit more and a little bit more she gets worse and worse until the day you finally pound the head of the nail into the tree she's dead and done for but if she can figure out a way to borrow something from you then she can undo this work against her and she's back to full power um, also, if she dies on your property while you're working this counter spell against her, then her spirit will stay with you and haunt you. So no matter which way you go, plenty of ways to screw up and get witches against you. They would oh, also, uh, there's, an, there's uh, an old belief that even after you kill a witch, you're no longer, you're not safe. They might rise back up or they might find some way for their dead spirit to get at you. So the way you keep a dead witch in the ground and dead, both her spirit and her body, is to bury her under a tree. And that's kind of where I ran with in, in my book about witches trying to figure out, like, what is my system for how are witches going to work? And I've got the Witch Finders Union, this modern uh, SWAT team-like paramilitary organization that uh, has to deal with the reality of witches in the modern world, or has always dealt with them, but continues to deal with them. Like, what kind of ammunition? Well, it depends on what kind of witch. All sorts of different kinds of witches, right? Uh, so, how do you deal with them? Well, some of them can only be dealt with in that kind of way. Like, those witches that can only be handled by burying them under a tree. So, I would have witch finders carrying some exotic load rounds in which uh, they're filled with different types of splinters of wood. Uh, the witch finders call them botanical rounds. So that's perhaps one way for you to deal with witches. Man, where else was she, where should we go? Um, oh, the the movie, The Witch. Uh, Robert Eggers made this movie a few years back. Uh, I think it was a Canadian production. Um, and this thing is amazing. I don't know if he... I, I saw that the internet had some hate for it, unfortunately, which is too bad. Uh, I, I imagine 
it's got to be in you know several years from now or maybe a decade or so from now people will look back on hating that movie like they hated i don't know citizen kane do you hate stanley kubrick's the shining like this thing is that good if you have any care at all for which is being done well and done right the dialogue from this movie is taken directly from old journals and old reports of the era Uh, this is set in 1700s which makes it kind of difficult to understand especially with some of the accents of the actors so here's how to watch it turn the sub english subtitles on if you're what if you're english speaking turn those subtitles on and you'll get the most out of this dialogue the shots are amazing and they get which is exactly right like the real fear that in early america your homestead was on the brink of madness and horror and hell just beyond the woods you're familiar with which are just beyond your house are savage creatures that want to eat you are witches that want to do worse things to you than just eat you and different incarnations of the devil which are worse than all of those things and they're all just out there blinking at you in the darkness in the night and that's the kind of witch you have to deal with and that's the kind of witch in this movie you get the i mean everything's classic you know you get the witch flying through the night and snatching up children and stuff but the reason the old witches were in real life said to snatch up like you know kidnap babies out of their homes at night where they would boil the babies down and render the fat and then cool it and smear it over their bodies and smear down their broomstick or their rake or whatever they used to fly on and then they would get naked onto the broom or the rake and fly right up their chimney and out the sky and off to a black sabbath or a witch's sabbath where the witches would gather with the various demons or maybe even satan himself in the woods around a big bonfire and they would engage in orgies and hors d'oeuvres and and trade secrets and it's not unlike i think a lot of uh, trade conventions these days and they would and they would conclude by everyone turning their back to each other and dancing uh, so, and that's kind of a horrifying image if if the rest wasn't horrifying enough so you get all of that in this movie the witch i think it's spelled with like two v's to form the w if you have trouble just finding the witch just a few years ago man that thing was good oh my god i'm running out of time i wanted to talk about the witch of koas ever so briefly the witch of koas uh by robert frost Uh, robert frost did so many cool things he's a poet that a lot of people know him uh, know his stuff like stopping by woods on the snowy evening or you know the whole road less traveled kind of thing the thing about robert robert frost is anytime you think you just found a robert frost poem that is kind of sweet and nice and safe you're reading it wrong because he was not like that and he was in fact if you read a robert frost poem and you think oh that was sweet that was nice then he just made fun of you in the poem go back and look at it deeper and more cynically and then you see a lot of cool stuff going on man the witch of Koas is it's the only it's the only kind of vaguely modern poem that kind of scares me and that i know of. no that's not true yates scares me too in really cool ways well let me give you a sense of it it starts off by saying i stay the night for shelter at a farm behind the mountain with a mother and son two old believers they did all the talking and then here comes the talking from the mother and son the two old believers he calls them the mother says folks think a witch who has familiar spirits she could call up to pass a winter evening but won't should be burned at the stake or something so many spirits isn't button button who's got the button you're to understand and the sun chimes in mother can make a common table rear and kick with two Two legs like an army mule, the mother says. And when I've done it, what good have I done? Rather than tip a table for you, let me tell you what Raleigh the Sioux Control once told me. Uh, Sioux Control being like the medicine man, the Sioux uh, drug. Uh, Back to the poem, she says, He said that the dead had souls, 
But when I asked him, how could that be? I thought the dead were souls. He broke my trance. Don't that make you suspicious that there's something the dead are keeping back? Yes, there's something the dead are keeping back. The son says, you wouldn't want to tell them what we have up attic, mother. The mother says, bones, a skeleton. The son says, but the headboard of mother's bed is pushed against the attic door. The door is nailed. It's harmless. Mother hears it in the night, halting, perplexed behind the barrier of door and headboard, where it wants to get is back into the cellar where it came from. The mother says, we'll never let him, will we, son? We'll never. The son says, it left the cellar 40 years ago. It carried itself like a pile of dishes, up one flight from the cellar to the kitchen, another from the kitchen to the bedroom, another from the bedroom to the attic, right past both father and mother, and neither stopped it. Father had gone upstairs. Mother was downstairs. I was a baby. I didn't know where I was. And then the mother, and this continues and continues for quite a while. I'll stop there. So now that you know, you need to read it. Which of Coos, Coos spelled C-O-O-S, uh, think a place in New England. Oh my goodness, we're out of time already. Well, we've got to stop talking about witches now. So how about, I've already dropped enough uh uh, dropped an off promotion from my own book, The Black Palace About Witches, by the way, on Amazon.com. So I'll let that be and say, I hope you found some stuff cool in this podcast. Thank you for listening to The Monster Professor. Drop me questions or requests uh, by contacting me at my website and joshwoodsauthor.com. And next time we're going to talk about a different monster. So... Stay tuned. Talk to you later. Thanks for listening to The Monster Professor.